This week we're going to be looking at the science of global warming. And part of our classroom discussion is going to be about what it means to save the planet. Um, when we look at global warming, a lot of times we can feel overwhelmed by the large list of impacts. And we're going to talk about uh, how we see our relationship with the environment, whether we are in control of nature or whether we are part of nature. So let's review a little bit about how heat interacts with Earth's atmosphere. Most of the heat in the atmosphere originates with the sun. The electromagnetic spectrum on page 14 lists all waves in order from shortest to longest wavelength. And you can see on the left side is all the shortest waves and the right side is all the longest waves. The uh, sunlight that we get uh, is mostly on the short wave side of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, most sunlight comes in the form of visible light. So uh, the basic way that the sun interacts with the atmosphere is that the short wave radiation comes into the atmosphere, it heats up the earth, and then long wave uh, infrared radiation in the form of heat heats up the air. Now if this was the only thing that happened, the earth's average temperature would be negative 18 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit. Fortunately, we have something called the greenhouse effect. Uh, that's basically where short wave uh, radiation from the sun it can enter through the glass of a greenhouse and then it heats up inside the greenhouse and then the heat um, in the form of long wave uh, infrared radiation can't escape through the glass and that's why a greenhouse gets hot. The same thing happens on Earth's atmosphere. Um, CO2 which is carbon dioxide, CH4 which is methane, and H2O make up um, less than 0.1% of the atmosphere, but they're able to return 84% of the sun's heat from the earth. And you can see here, uh, this is showing how uh, those gases absorb the, the heat from that was radiated from the earth and it uh, traps. Well, we know that CO2 is one of the main greenhouse gases and the question is, where does it come from? Well, it turns about 95% of the CO2 in our atmosphere uh, it actually comes from natural sources like volcanoes and fires and um, the, the ocean and also just respiration of animals. About 5% um, comes from human-made emissions from fossil fuels or cement production and deforestation and changing land use. Uh, now even though this is only about 5%, that's enough to upset the, ba upset the balance in what's called the carbon cycle. Now um, earlier in your education, you may have learned a little bit about the basics of the carbon cycle, which is where um, animals, and including humans, will breathe out carbon dioxide gas, and plants uh, will t breathe it in, and then the plants breathe out oxygen, which is what um, animals, including humans, uh, need to survive. Um, in this class, we'll learn that uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, when you breathe out carbon dioxide, for example, about 50% of it enters into the atmosphere. Uh, about 26% of it is absorbed by plants. Um, and then about 24% of it is absorbed in the ocean. Uh, and that's part of what makes carbonic acid in the ocean. We can see here that when you have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, less heat is able to escape from the Earth. Earth's atmosphere has changed many times in the last 4.6 billion years. Early in Earth's history, the atmosphere used to be as high as 39% carbon dioxide. Today, CO2 makes up only about 0.039% of the Earth's atmosphere, but again, that's enough to make a really big difference in the temperature on Earth. Um, other planets, like Venus, uh, are made up of about 96% carbon dioxide, and they have what's called a runaway greenhouse effect. The average temperature on Venus is about 450 degrees Celsius or 840 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the concern is that the Earth could have a runaway greenhouse effect and this was first proposed by a guy named, a guy named Svante Arrhenius. Uh, he said back in 1898 that uh, if we doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere this could result in a uh, temperature change of about 5 to 6 degrees Celsius. Well what he saw back in 1898 was a graph that might have looked sort of like this. Um, about a hundred years later today, this is the graph uh, that we see. You can see that the current 
estimation for um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is uh, over 360 parts per million, which is uh, very high. You can see here too, this is based off of largely from ice core data that we're going to learn about in class. You can see that for 650,000 years, the atmospheric CO2 has never been above uh, 300 parts per million until uh, the 1940s when um, it's gone up and up and up and uh, it's nearly approaching 400 parts per million. What changed to put all of this carbon into the air? Uh, a lot of this started during the Industrial Revolution, uh, which is basically the uh, 1700s and 1800s. We saw some really big changes in um, how society um, interacted with its environment using more machines and more factories and more travel. Um, we are extracting fossil fuels from the earth and all fossil fuels are based off of these hydrocarbon chains and when you burn them um, you are creating a reaction which takes that carbon in the center and it reacts with oxygen to create uh, carbon dioxide in the air. About 86 percent of our fuel needs come from fossil fuels. Uh, the other remaining percent um, comes from uh, nuclear energy, hydroelectric energy, and a very small amount comes from alternative energy like uh, wind and solar electricity. We can see here that we spend about 33 percent of our energy on transportation and about 66 percent of our energy on uh, electricity and uh, thermal energy or heat. And lastly, we can see this map below shows the proportions of uh, people and how much energy they use. And you can see that an average American uses more energy than any average Amer citizen of any other country. And so that's one of the other things we'll be discussing a lot in class this week.